what we kind of like to do here at the net is every Sunday we will show a video clip kind of going along with the message that Pastor Glenn's going to bring. So if y'all can sit back and watch it with me. My other Akulas. We can play these games all night, Mr. Hunter, but I don't have the luxury of your presumptions. Sir. Mr. Hunter, we have rules that are not open to interpretation, personal intuition, gut feelings, hairs on the back of your neck, little devils or angels sitting on your shoulders. Captain, yes. We're all very well aware what our orders are and what those orders mean. They come down from our commander-in-chief. They contain no ambiguity. Captain, Mr. Sir. Hunter, I've made a decision. I'm captain of this boat. That Weapons, con. Ship targeting to target package SLBM 64741 2. This is the captain. Captain, I cannot concur. Repeat my command. Sir, we don't know what this message means. Our target package could have changed. You repeat this order or I'll find somebody who will. No, no, you won't, sir. You're relieved to your position. Cobb? Remove Mr. Hunter from the control room. Get no, Lieutenant sir. Zimmer in here no, right sir. now. No, sir. I do not concur, and I do not recognize your authority to relieve me under command under Navy regulations. Cobb, arrest this man Captain and get him out of here. Under operating procedures governing the release of nuclear weapons, we cannot launch our missiles unless both you and I agree. Cobb, what are you waiting for? Authority, sir. This is expressly why your command must be repeated. It requires my assent. I do not give it. And furthermore, you continue upon this course and insist upon this launch without confirming this message the boat. by the rules of precedence. Captain Captain commanding officer of command. the USS Alabama. Regulations I order you to place the XO under arrest on the charge of the Navy regulations. I say it again. I order you to place the XO under arrest on the charge of mutiny. Cop! Captain, please, the XO is right. We can't launch unless he concurs. To the USS Alabama. Rebel-controlled missiles being fueled. Launch codes compromised. Dissonance threatened launch at continental United States. Set DEFCON 2. Immediately launch 10 Trident missile sorties. They're fueling their missiles! We don't... Sir, I think you need time to think this over. I don't have to think this over! Captain, I relieve you of your command of this ship. So the title of this message is The Great Mutiny. So, I thought that clip worked. Um, he accused his exo of mutiny. And so, we're going to look at the greatest mutiny of all time. So, I want us to, perhaps you've had a, uh, actually, before we go any further, I'd like us to pray a moment. And it's really, really good seeing. I, I kind of projected that we'd have a few more people this week than last week, and it seems to be fitting the tab. I uh, appreciate a few more of y'all coming out this week, and the next week for Mother's Day, I expect that we'll be. So what I'm actually looking at when I look at our crowd this morning is, how do we socially distance with more people? And so that's kind of what I'm looking at. Um, I can see that we could add a few more this morning, um, and still socially distance, two chairs between households kind of thing. And then we can still add more chairs in the back. If we had to, we could sit people on the floor too. You know, just whatever we need to do to make it work, right? Uh, we'll just keep putting people in here and six foot spacing best we can, right? And um, you like your extra floor space? Did you use that this morning to dance to the Lord? See, you know, how many times you think, well, I really would like to dance to the Lord today, but there's just no space. Well, here you have it. You finally have space, so, so, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, Lord, we just welcome you this morning. We look to you to speak to us in your word. We look to you to be active and pursuing us this morning. We pray that our hearts be honest and open to you. I pray for all of those in our live feed audience this morning, that we pray that you bless them, that they would have a sense of connection with us right now as we come in agreement and we commit this time to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So perhaps you've worked for someone that you felt like was oppressive or unfair. Anybody? Ever had a boss that just seemed like they were unreasonable and you couldn't seem to work with them, but yet you had to work with them, and then maybe you thought of even ways to try to 
try to fight back. You think, well, maybe I just need to quit. Maybe I just need to. And so we've all had these situations where the authorities in our lives are not always the way in behaving and acting the way we'd like them to, right? And so you may even in that situation, you might think of a lot of creative measures that you might do to try to fight back. But when people get really, really desperate, they can consider taking over by brute force. And, and, I'll, and I'll tell you, the majority of the time, it's not right, and it's not blessed of God, uh, except when it comes to America. <laughs> there are occasions when unjust rulers need to be dethroned. But I'm going to tell you about the most famous mutiny. I would say it's probably the most famous mutiny of all time, and that is, that is from uh, the HMS Bounty. You've all heard of mutiny on the bounty, right? And so you, you probably may know the story somewhat. There's been about 10 movies made of this story, but, but it's a remarkable story. But basically, it's a small British naval ship, and there are about 55 you know, individuals on this ship. Captain Bly, who you probably have heard that name before, was the captain of the ship. And so there was a mutiny. And in this mutiny, they, well, there's a whole process that led up to that. It's really crazy. But they ended up on a Tahitian island for five months before the mutiny occurred. And they started mixing with the native ladies. And they started, you know, and they, they kind of began to, I think their heads just got mixed up. Because it's a very rare thing to have a mutiny in the British Navy ever or in any Navy. And so, but nonetheless, through a course of events, and you can read those for yourself. They're all fairly well documented. They, uh, the, the ship's crew divided in half, basically close to half. And so I believe it was 22 of the officers and the captain were set adrift. And they were set adrift. They end up on a Tahitian island. One of them got killed. They end up facing cannibals, and then they end up off somewhere else. So they end up literally sailing across the, the, the ocean 3,000 miles. And they all survived except one. Interestingly, the mutineers who kept the ship you can actually look at what happened to each one of them. It's all a matter of record. And they all ended up with just horrible endings, nearly all of them. I think one or two of them seemed to kind of be able to live their life out in peace. But by and large, the 25 mutineers were just had awful endings, even though the majority of them were never caught by the British. Some of them were. So that was in 1789, and the, the tragic outcome of that mutiny and even though those sailors may have felt at the moment, hey, you know, this is a great idea. Let's rebel. Let's take over the ship. We'll be in control. In fact, it ended up leading to great tragedy for all of them. The, all the sailors that were set adrift survived. They actually made it 3,000 miles and were back to the United Kingdom. So we're going to look at the greatest mutiny of all time. We're going to look at a parable of Jesus. So when you look at this in Matthew 21 is where we're going to be referencing. This parable, Jesus begins to reference a vineyard. And I want you to get the imagery here because he gets this imagery from the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the Bible that Jesus read. There was no other Bible that Jesus read. This was it. So when he references something like a vineyard as an imagery, it's because it is something well established in the Old Testament as symbolizing Israel and God's relationship to Israel, which was oftentimes strained and difficult. But God nonetheless was faithful to Israel even when they were unfaithful. And so when Jesus begins to talk about this imagery of the, we're going to start in Matthew chapter 21, verse 33. Just remember that he's talking right now and there are all kinds of religious Jewish leaders listening in on what they're saying and what he's saying and they're becoming very defensive, of course, of anything he says. But he really is pointing at them when he starts sharing some of these things. But in a way, he's pointing at us too. So the first half of the first verse 33 says, he says to the, them, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. That was a classic picture of an ancient vineyard. And so I want to reference one of those Old Testament references in Isaiah. And there are numerous references, but this one is just so personal on the part of God speaking through the prophet. In Isaiah chapter 5, he says, 
And this is called the song of the vineyard. See, if you think of this like a song, like it's very tender, almost a a sense of brokenheartedness in this song, as the Lord essentially is speaking about his vineyard and what the vineyard has meant to him. So he says, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. And then he begins to prophesy. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard that I have not done for it? When I looked for grapes, why did it yield only bad? What an interesting posture for the God of the universe to take concerning Israel. That he is expressing, in essence, a sense of hope. That he invested and he was looking and watching for them to bring about a good return in this relationship. And it just turns bad once again. And so you can sense that brokenheartedness. And then following this, he begins to speak about judgment and so forth. But what we see here is God's original intent for his vineyard, this tenderness, this desire to have relationship, and and the fact that God did everything for this vineyard that he could possibly do to give it good success and to be able to essentially cultivate a fabulous relationship with Israel and Judah. So God's role in the vineyard story is as the benevolent landowner. Remember, he is benevolent. He is not a tyrant. He's not oppressive. Any more than the picture in Isaiah was that a tender love and cultivating spirit in the heart of the landowner. And so we see this affectionate attachment that God has to his people. Continuing in that verse, it says that he rented, this is Jesus' parable, continue, then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. So if you follow this, the owner, the landowner, he left the vineyard, he went off to another place. We don't know, but he's doing business, presumably. And so what he's saying is that that I've left stewards in charge. They are essentially representing my interests, and they are in charge and the, re- the arrangement is that they receive, in other words, he just receives a share of the produce, but they are highly incentivized that as they produce and make the vineyard produce, that they will raise and increase their income. And so he's coming back, he's sending representatives, he's basically coming back to them and saying, well, you know, we have harvest time, we have a season, the investment's been made, we, we purchased and bought and built this whole thing, and now what we're looking for is for our share. We need a return on our investment. It's interesting how often the Bible, how Jesus will often talk and use parables that really are very capitalist. I know nowadays among many young people, the the C word is almost like a profane word, but not to God. God believes in incentives and private property and boundaries and all these things. So here you see it again in this parable. The owner seems detached, and yet he remains vested in what's happening in his vineyard. Even though he is in a distance, he still knows what's happening. He's paying attention more than they think he is. Do you think that God is detached? Do you think that God is detached from your life? I think sometimes we get this sense that, you know, I haven't heard from him in a while. I don't sense him. I haven't felt him in a while. Gee whiz, we haven't been able to go to church for six weeks. So, you know, God seems pretty detached right now. There's a lot of perspectives that we may have, and sometimes our emotions are not a good indicator of how close or how much God is paying attention to our lives. So he says, so we have to remember in the same way that even though it may feel at times that he's detached, in fact, he is not. And he is watching, and he is looking to see our lives and he has invested in each and every one of us. And we'll talk about that moment, more in a moment. But now we're going to come to the part of the text where we're going to look at the great mutiny. What's a mutiny? I have a little definition here. So mutiny, an open rebellion against the proper authorities, especially 
by soldiers or sailors against their officers. Especially used as a verb for those who refuse to obey the orders of a person in authority. They're mutinous. And so, we'll continue reading Matthew 21, verse 35 to 39. The tenants seized his servants. So remember, the landowner has sent his messengers, his servants have come to get the cut, his share of the produce. And it says, so they received these guys, they beat one of them, they kill one of them, and they stone the third one. That's pretty bad. <laughs> I don't like it. They beat one, stone one, and kill one. It's not a real good response to their land, their benevolent landowner, is it? Then he sent other servants. More than the first time, so more than three. And these tenants were treated in the same way. They treated these servants the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. And he says to himself, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now I'll tell you what, this is a pretty profound parable. When you realize the parallels that Jesus is telling and foreshadowing his own death and the rejection that Israel is ultimately going to have of his ministry, it is so amazing. Today, you know, you see people around the country that are trying to resist authority. And I kind of, there's a side of me, there's kind of a, a, a rebel side of me that sympathizes with a salon owner that's struggling to just make ends meet. They have to pay all their bills, but they can't work. You have, uh, I saw another one in California that says, I'm just going to open anyway. We're going to pay everybody. We're going to cut hair. And so you see this kind of, a bit of, a bit of mild defiance, if you will, a, mid, a, a, mid, a, you know, a mild civil disobedience, if you will. Everybody knows in the back of the mind this is all temporary and it's going to shift. And then we'll all look back at it from a year forward and go, man, that was a weird period of time. What were we thinking? <laughs> you know, so. But you see that kind of pockets of resistance around the country, especially where the government has been, been more draconian. Uh, we've seen churches that have been restrained and really essentially almost, almost I would say the word persecuted, but they've been unfairly treated. And they've hired lawyers and they fought back. In almost every case, the churches are winning. And the reason they win is because we have a First Amendment. We have it in, our, in the holy writ of the Constitution of the U.S. that churches are protected from govern, government overreach. So, so but here, we, you know, when we look at the American roots of our own revolution, Essentially, we threw off the, what we felt and believed at that time, and I would agree with them, was an oppressive overreach of the British government. And one of the, mon one of the kind of things that was said over and over and over was taxation without representation. They, were, they, were, they felt that there was an unjust relationship with Great Britain. And so they began to push back. But it's interesting when you read the Declaration of Independence that it is a radical document. And I was privileged to actually see the Declaration of Independence in Washington, D.C. a while back, maybe a year or so ago, and was shocked at how faded it was. It's like it's, like it's, it's all these years old, over 200 years old, right? And so it's, it's very faded. Um, so here's what it says, this one phrase, I find it fascinating. It says that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute a new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. What a remarkable statement. And to think that that's still essentially the founding documents of our country. And so what they were saying was that they believed that it was a justified essential rebellion or, uh, against the authorities of Great Britain that were, had become unduly oppressive. So they were, they were it's kind of a mutinous act, in a sense, against an entire government. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip this a little bit, because most of the time we think of a mutiny, it's because it's a reaction to an oppressive 
even against tyranny. But what about a mutiny against a benevolent ruler? See, that's more difficult to grasp, but yet it can happen. I have a notable thought for you. That's my chance, if you're relatively new here, you probably don't know this yet, but this is my chance to quote myself. In most cases in which a mutiny occurs, people believe their leaders to be acting against their best interests, usually to an extreme. But how do you justify overthrowing a benevolent ruler? Sometimes people will undermine a just ruler or authority in their lives because they have an agenda that clashes with the authority's policies. So when we look at, there were mutinous attempts in the Continental Army under George Washington. George Washington was a benevolent leader. He was remarkably benevolent. You know that when all the officers, when it was so hard at Valley Forge, and the officers would say, I need permission to go home, I need a chance to see my family, whatever, and the officers would just repeatedly leave Valley Forge while all the troops are still there and they're on the edge of starvation for weeks and weeks. And George Washington stayed there the whole time. He never left. He gained the respect of those troops. But nonetheless, even though he was benevolent and he was virtuous, there were, mut there were, there were mutiny attempts among the Continental Army to cast out their own officers, to, to rebel, to resist, because they felt the conditions were so squalid, the conditions were so horrific that they were going through, and they were in so much pain, and they were on the edge of survival, that they were desperate. But for whatever reason, nonetheless, they felt that they needed to rebel, and those rebellions were put down. But nonetheless, one of giving you an example from history where people rebelled to a benevolent leader, essentially, George Washington. So here we are, human beings, and we have a benevolent ruler. We have God the Creator. And in a sense, we are His vineyard. When Jesus looked at Jerusalem as He's approaching Jerusalem, he makes a statement that in many ways is reminiscent of this parable. So the idea in the parable is that messengers were sent, servants of the landowner were sent, they were rejected. And then tears in waves, the first one, the second one, and finally the son himself is sent. And it kind of, this reminds me of that process because Jesus is looking at Jerusalem stands outside the city, and he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those sent to her, to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. It's the same benevolent heart. Jesus standing in the role and the place of Yahweh himself and the way that he's speaking, how often I in first person wanted to gather you as a hen does her chicks. Looking at the annals of history, Jesus is seeing himself in the role of Yahweh in relationship to Israel. And he's saying, I sent you these people. I sent you the prophets. And you stone those who were sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as hen to see, but you were not willing. They were defiant. They were rebellious. Why is that? What was their agenda that so conflicted with the virtuous, benevolent creator that loved them? God is the benevolent ruler. And in the end, he did send his own son. What was their motive? It says what their motive is. It says, let's take, it, let's take the inheritance. They wanted to rule. They wanted complete control. They believed they were entitled. They forgot that they were just stewards. They resented his ownership. They wanted a mutiny. Isn't that really what man is still doing today? Aren't we still just fighting for control and shrugging off God and not taking seriously the claims of Scripture or the claims of Jesus himself? and continuing to rebel and continuing to dig our heels in. Why? Why? Because we have our own agenda. We have our own selfish path that we have chosen to follow relentlessly. 
We are still, as humanity, in a state of mutiny against the creator of the universe, who is always benevolent towards us. You see, by sending his son, the owner, proved that he truly cared about the vineyard. There was no greater expression of love that he could possibly extend toward the, the, uh, the caretakers of the vineyard than to send his own son. Certainly they will treat him differently. It's the same way with God towards us. God, what does the scripture say? God so loved the world. He loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten son. You see, God demonstrated finally, once and for all, indisputably, that he is the benevolent creator and he would spare nothing to reach our hearts and to restore the friendship that was broken. He offered that which was the most precious thing to him, his son. And that's what God did. Continuing in Matthew, Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end. And they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenant, tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. In other words, he was reasonable. I just need my cut. I just expect you to be responsible and faithful and have integrity. But no, this is a no-nonsense businessman, too. Not only does he care and he's passionate about his love for the vineyard, and, but he's also a businessman. He is, he is looking for an outcome. And I mentioned it earlier. He is a true capitalist. He made an investment and expects a return on that investment. Those that work for him are rewarded accordingly. Note, he only receives a share of the tenant's harvest. They keep the rest. They are incentivized to work hard and to produce. So the more they work, the more they produce, the more they make. There will be a judgment. His ultimate object objectives will be accomplished. And in the same way, when we reject the Son, there is a severe consequence of those actions. Because we, as human beings, rejected a benevolent creator, a benevolent authority, a benevolent ruler of the universe. So let's look at Matthew 21, verse 42 to 45. Jesus said to them, <laughs> I love how he does this. He says, have you never read the scriptures? <laughs> I love that. Well, he's really looking to get along here, isn't he? You hear all these religious guys looking there, looking down their nose at him. I know he's talking about us. I know he's talking about us. And it actually says that. And then he goes, have you never? It's kind of like, can you imagine I'm talking to somebody and I go, have you never even read your Bible? What's wrong with you? I mean, you know, I feel so hurt. I feel so hurt the pastor would talk to me like that. Who does he think he is? You know, he knows they've read the scripture. He's to some extent mocking them. He's agitating them. He is, he's poking the bear, so to speak. This is so intentional. That's why I was talking about Friday night to our young people, our young adults on Friday night. I said, are we following the Jesus of the Bible or are we following somebody else? This is the Jesus of the Bible. And he has a no-nonsense side to him. And so he's saying, have you never read the scriptures. It's, he, in other words, what he's saying is your attitude and your approach and your, the reflection of your ideas look at appears that you have never read the Bible at all, that you have no idea what you're talking about. How could you express so much ignorance for a book that you've actually been reading? You know, it's interesting. People can read the same material and come up with a different conclusion. And it, remember, much of it depends on the disposition of our hearts. So he quotes then Psalm 118. He says, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and is marvelous in our eyes. 
That's the end of the quote from Psalms 118. Then he continues, he says, Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. And so Jesus is the son that was sent and rejected. He is the chief cornerstone. There was a stone and nobody wanted to use it, but that stone ends up fitting just right in the corner and it becomes the guide, it becomes the standard, it becomes the, the plumb line for the entire building. The entire structure now depends on the cornerstone and that's the way Jesus' role is today. Everything revolves around the cornerstone. What he's saying is the Jewish leaders who are there listening have squandered God's goodness. And that he is going to reprioritize this relationship with Israel. And now that relationship is broader based. It's going to be involving the Gentiles. The entire world is now a part of the agenda of God, which it always was. So I want to comment about this phrase. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be, will be crushed. The choice before the religious leaders who are listening is the choice before all of us. We can be honest and broken before God in repentance or be completely broken by judgment itself. And every human being has that choice. Are we going to submit to the ultimate sovereign authority and ruler of the entire universe? Are we going to continue to be? I, I've used this little example over the years. I don't even remember where I got it from. It might be Winky or somebody. But, but the thing is, is that it's, it's a picture of the uh, steamroller, right? And the steamroller's rolling along, and there's a little ant on the ground. And he's looking up at that steamroller in his little voice. And he's looking at that steamroller and he's going, do you want to fight? You know, you picture that. It's like, okay, this is what man is doing today. God is this gigantic steamroller who uses great restraint in holding back judgment. You think about how he sent the prophets and he warned Israel and he would wait and he would delay judgment and he would appeal and he would petition and he would send weeping prophets and prophesying prophets and all kinds of uh, men that would come and many of them were tortured and killed and, and persecuted because they represented the interests of God. And so yet God being this giant steamroller in the universe is not necessarily rolling over that ant. The ant has been given time. The ant has been given opportunity. The little ant, the little arrogant, fist-clenched ant is allowed the freedom to defy with what seems to be no immediate consequences. Has ultimate control been settled in your life? How are we approaching God? Are we more of a mutineer with our own agenda, following our own, our own interests, our own passions, our own everything? It's just all about us? Or has there been a fundamental shift in who we are in our relationship to our Creator? And that is that we have a repentant and broken spirit, understanding that we owe everything to Him, the benevolent Creator, the, the vine keeper who has, the vineyard keeper who has provided everything for us in Christ. There's nothing that he could have offered better than Jesus. But would we continue to crucify him? Would we continue to reject him? And so listen, you know, if, if you're on the live feed and you're listening to this and maybe, maybe you haven't establish that relationship, that right standing with God. Maybe you realize that sometimes we can have mutinous attitudes and maybe you need to really readjust and reapproach the Lord and say, Lord, I'm, I'm here to serve you, not you serving me. 
I'm here to follow you. I'm here to love you. I'm here to glorify you with my entire life. It's so easy for us to be preoccupied with all of our own things. But I want to encourage you today to reconsider Christ and His appropriate role in our lives. And don't be on the side of the mutineers. It ends up poorly for them. Father, we just thank You that just like the songs we sing, that God is good. And Lord, we just thank You for the great privilege we have of serving a benevolent King. That Lord, You truly have our best interests at heart. You proved it by sending Jesus. That You truly, truly love us. And You established it for all time when You sent Your only Son God, may we give Him the honor. May we give Him the glory that is due His name. Holy Spirit, cleanse us. Wash us. If we, anybody here or listening has been mutinous, Lord, may there be a brokenness and a humbling in our hearts. We pray it all in the name that is truly above every name, the name of Jesus. Amen.